It is indeed a beautiful day here in Austin, a wonderful day to come together. It is very clear that someone has a direct line to the one upstairs. Now that's clout. Dean, you got some game, no doubt. And to the class of 2023, wow. You're all graduating from Harvard Business School. Now that's hot. Even for millennials who downplay everything, that's huge. Congratulations. <laughs> so I want to lead with gratitude, as I always try to do. Let us first acknowledge that neither I nor you would be here without the steady hand of grace. I want to thank Dean Dattar. Your leadership is indeed exemplary. Thank you to the world-class faculty and to the students who invited me. You have done me great honor. But from this, the biggest of stages, I cannot help myself. I gotta give a few shout outs. Thank you, Nell Scavell. Shout out to my old Section H. Shout out to ASU. <laughs> Hello to the Lewis family and the Hess family, especially my main guys, Carter and Willie, two of the class of 2023's superstars. John Hess, your support of HBS and your exemplary leadership of its capital campaign has been extraordinary. To the James family, I see you, Keith. I see you, my law school roommate who is now the mayor of West Palm Beach, Florida. And to my immediate family, my brilliant and beautiful better three quarters wife, Crystal, and our children, Cole, Ella, and Leo. And to all the family celebrating today, we are honoring you too, especially those who come from great distances. The love and care and sacrifice of fathers, yes, but especially the aunts, sisters, brothers, grandparents, and dearest of them all, mothers. But please, if you will, give me leave and pause for this last shout out. Today, we are in the presence of a civil rights icon, the godfather, Clarence B. Jones. For those of you who do not know him, you should. You've heard of Martin Luther King, King Jr., of course. And all of you know that he was jailed in Birmingham, Alabama for participating in a nonviolent protest against segregation. You know when you get thrown in jail, you get one call. And Dr. King called his lawyer, Clarence B. Jones, who sits to my left, right below the tree. Dr. Jones. And down in Birmingham, Dr. Jones smuggled out one of the most important documents in American history, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. He came to New York, went into the vault of the Chase Manhattan Bank to get the money from John D. Rockefeller to, to post bail. And later he helped to draft the I Have a Dream speech. Dr. Jones, you are what Martin Luther King Jr. called a wintertime soldier. Under the coldest and harshest conditions, you fought for justice. Without you, it is unlikely that many of us, especially those who look like me, would be here. Dr. Jones, we are all honored by your presence. Looking into this gathering reminds me, as F. Scott Fitzgerald would say, of my younger and more vulnerable days. Someone asked me how it is that I made it here. And I tell them the four Ps, prayer, because this has been a walk of faith, preparation, performance, and paranoia. <laughs> I was raised by a single mother and grandparents in the neighborhood of Dayton, Ohio. I never knew my dad wrong side of the tracks. We had all the things that, the basics that money could buy, but more importantly, we had all the things that money could not buy. Faith, respect, and love, and values. My mother had a high school diploma. 
She worked several jobs to make ends meet. She became a social worker. My grandfather reached third grade and was a janitor and the state Sunday school superintendent. My grandmother was a missionary and church mother. Their lives were lives of service, but still they knew as the Greek philosopher slave Epictetus explained long ago that only the educated are free. Their encouragement and the challenge of my 11th grade teacher to go east and test myself against the big boys and girls. I led at the Hotchkiss School and from there I made it to Harvard College all on scholarship. As an undergrad, I majored in what would inform life on Wall Street, not economics or math. I concentrated in English and American literature. See, if you want to learn about leadership and organizational behavior, read Macbeth. If you want to learn about the street strategic decision making, read Hamlet. If you want to learn about estate planning, read Lear. As a senior, I had zero interest in studying business until one day on campus, I ran into a pre-business tutor named Lawrence Jackson. Larry explained that half the grade in business school would come from, and I'm going to dress this up now, classroom debate. I like debate. I was intrigued by the opportunity to write six or seven essays about myself. I applied. I wrote a few more essays for Harvard Law School and eventually computed the joint JDMA program, all on scholarship and student loans. After all that education, I had to get a job. A section mate told me about this business called investment banking. So I interviewed with one of the top Wall Street firms and in response to an interviewer's question as to why I should be chosen for one of two summer associate jobs out of about 750 students, I responded from the neighborhood, if you imagine, Harvard College, Harvard Law School, Harvard Business School pride themselves on taking the cream of the crop. I pride myself on being the film off the top of the cream. <laughs> Metaphor got me the job. <laughs> there were a few role models who looked like me in the client-facing, deal-making, capital-raising world of finance. Each step of the way, I encountered every imaginable obstacle, embarrassment, classism, and racism. I once had a boss that ignored me, didn't talk to me for six months, never quite understood what was behind being ghosted. But I remember if we were headed toward each other in the hall, he'd veer off in another direction. In meetings when I spoke, he didn't acknowledge my presence. But my four Ps, the paranoia led me to construct numerous explanations, all of which had me questioning my behavior and not his. Whatever the rationale, I was reminded of what W.E.B. Du Bois called a duality of consciousness, or in the words of that inimitable writer, Ralph Allison, invisible man, play the game but don't believe in it. While I was lonely, I had not only to endure, but I had to prevail. I had no plan B. If I hadn't performed, the majority would have said, I told you so. Forty years later, the record shows that I've, completed among, I've competed amongst the best. I've advised some of the most demanding and sophisticated senior leaders in their boards and over $750 billion of corporate transactions led global business longer than anyone in the history of Wall Street. So maybe that film on the top of the cream metaphor turned enough to be okay. And while I blazed my own specific trail investment banking, I was inspired by the success and mentorship of giants like Franklin A. Thomas and Vernon Jordan and Dick Parsons and Reginald Lewis and Ken Chenault and Garland Wood, the first African-American partner at the firm Goldman Sachs. I stood on their shoulders. And along the way, I recognized there, there were those in the next generation who might stand on mine. So when those coming up reached out, I vowed to return every phone call and respond to every email. I was fully engaged in passing the torch with individuals while also guiding the boards of various cultural and educational organizations. Still, I thought that given where I'd come from and the experiences that I had lived, that there was more for me to do. I'd witnessed how my mother and grandparents' dedication to service had changed lives. And while they never had economic privilege, they had spiritual privilege. They each had what William Cuthbert Faulkner said in his Nobel Peace Prize speech, they had a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. So I thought to realize the promise of a future being better than the past, I would have to enter the larger stage, the public arena. 
And I've lived and worked in New York City for 40 years. I raised my family there. It's a great big city with great big problems. During COVID, the U.S. stock market hit historic highs, while many experienced depression here at levels of hunger. Today, many remain hungry. New York City Housing Authority residents still live with mold in their walls and lead-filled pipes from which the toddlers and the elderly drink. Sobered by these grim realities of the profound, profane, and catastrophic economic, social, and educational divide that persists systematically, I dug in. And I discovered these problems were complicated, deeply ingrained, also highly solvable. So why did these injuries and injustices persist? It's because too many who go into public service are actually in self-service. In order to keep their jobs, some politicians become the gatekeepers of poverty, watching with apparent disregard as their constituents' lives descend into deplorable conditions. I wanted to intervene to disrupt the ineffective government. So with the sword of my family and close friends, I quit my job. I ran for the Democratic nomination for mayor of New York City in 2021. Spoiler alert, I didn't win. <laughs> the packaging didn't work. I was the first time candidate, and while I knew the policy cold, policy didn't really matter. The neighborhood didn't trust the corporate world. But while I didn't win, I never felt that I lost. I showed my granddaddy's courage and my mother's grit. I entered in the arena. I walked away deeply inspired by those who were with me from the beginning to the end, many known, some completely unknown. And I learned the hard lessons of who my true friends are. And I learned, as Omar told us on the wire, there's a game out there. You either play or be played. Post-election, I weighed the possibilities of what next. Because of my record, I had options. I decided that I wanted to return to finance. It was a world that I knew well, one that I'd helped to build. I wanted a flat form, platform that was global. I wanted to be in a leadership role. I wanted to make certain that I would have the visibility and availability and accessibility to continue to have an impact. I reemerged as a president of the 175-year-old storied financial services institution, Lazard. I've been on the job for about six weeks now, and each day brings a new challenge. Now, your story is about to be written. And as Samuel Beckett said, it is not every day that we are needed, not indeed that we personally are needed. Others would meet the task equally as well, if not better. To all mankind, these were addressed, those cries for help still ringing in our ears. But at this place, at this moment of time, all mankind is us. Whether we like it or not, let us make the most of it before it is too late. The world you're entering is facing unprecedented uncertainty. And with that comes unprecedented opportunity to make a difference. You will make millions, and some of you billions. And you can choose to remain comfortably on the sidelines, but to remain uninvolved, you will ignore the conditions of today, what Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel called a human emergency, that massive sense of inferiority and creeping bitterness. Let me bring Rabbi Heschel's emergency closer to home. In a world where the political divide permeates the landscape, the wealth divide is corrosive. While the gatekeepers of poverty run the public sector, in the corporate world, the gatekeepers of wealth remain in force. Despite the rhetoric of progress, the number of diverse members on boards of directors remains all too small. CEOs remain over overwhelmingly white and men. Since the beginning of the Fortune 500 68 years ago, there have been almost 2,000 CEOs. And at most, 20 have been black. Four of them were interim. Three have been women. In the 70 plus trillion dollar world of US asset management, black and brown managers oversee circa 1%. Women managers don't manage that much more. And if we move from Wall Street to Main Street, 
We see an even harsher reality. A median white family averages $184,000 in wealth. A median Hispanic family, $38,000 in wealth. A median black family, $23,000 in wealth. Ball don't lie. The wealth and racial divides are just two of the urgent existential challenges facing this country. And there are at least seven others that will require your attention. The political divide is not sustainable. We live in a country where extremism is no longer extreme. Two, the K through 12 public education system that was designed to provide equal access to the American dream is an abject failure. Three, the geopolitical discord, especially between the United States and China, is a bad recipe. Competition is healthy. But the relationship between these powers is increasingly fractured, which is dangerous. Four, democracy's promise and continued existence is being threatened by those who fear that the only thing between their present superior position and extinction is to destroy democracy. The hard-fought right to vote is being threatened. A woman's right to choose is being denied. Withers it fled. The visionary gleam, where is it now? The freshness of the dream. Five, climate and energy transition. Our climate is warming and we need a real global climate strategy. While today the U.S. energy is secure, the country continues to underinvest in the continent of Africa, even though it has vast resources and precious minerals, which are central to realizing any effective energy transition. Six, generative artificial intelligence. It is changing how we think, how we interact with each other. It is influencing the very basics of humanity. It is a tool which we can use to the benefit of all. And how we approach these critical issues depends on existential challenge number seven, your own moral compass. At the core of your compass is your word. There is no higher currency. Your word is your bond. It must be non-negotiable. Greed is not good. If you trade your values for money, your life will be as Shakespeare told us in Macbeth. It will be a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. I stand here today with conviction that there is no better group to capitalize on and address these local, state, national, and global challenges than the talent leaders of this HBS class. Who better to bridge the divide than you who hail from around the globe and have been exchanging ideas and breaking down artificial barriers in section or some far off beach on a leadership escapade. Each be a shine in its commitment to staying above parochial and divisive politics. Many of the highest ranking and most respected leaders in the corporate world have preceded you. Yet there has been never a greater need for HBS trained leaders with an unwavering North Star. Tomorrow, Adorned in your regal cap and gown, you will be seated in the Tercent Tenary Theater, preceded by the sheriffs of Middlesex and Suffolk counties. The president of Harvard's, incant the president of Harvard's incantation will confer your degree, and you return to this campus, and the great dean will officially bestow upon you a master's in business administration. From then on, it's up to you to create out of the spirit something which did not exist before. Your legacy resides somewhere between the wealth that you create and the lives you impact. And your privilege will give you a choice. Be ever mindful that in the fight to preserve our republic and to save our climate, 
there can be no spectators. And let me end where I began with hope and conviction. Because of HBS and the lessons of leadership, the world's best days are ahead of us. Or in the words of that great 20th century philosopher, and I think many of you may know his poem, and you may have embraced his poetry, and it goes something like this. Thinking back on my one-room shack, now my mom pimps an AC with minks on her back. And she loves to show me off, of course, smiles every time my face is up in the source. Anybody know this? We did what? We used to fuss when the landlord dissed us. No heat. Wonder why Christmas missed us. And birthdays were the worst days. Now we sip champagne when we're Thursday. Damn right I like the life I live because it went from negative to positive. And it's all good. It's all good. And if you don't know, now you know. Congratulations, class of 2023. The world is in your hands. Legacy, 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 legacy. Black excellence, baby. You don't let them see. Legacy, 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 legacy. Black excellence, baby. Let them see. I'm going to be like this in the new time.